invite you to take your Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to 1 Samuel chapter 21. This evening we'll give our attention to 1 Samuel 21, verse 1 through 22, and verse 5. This is the word of our God. We must give our attention to his reading. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling, and said to him, Why are you alone, and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech, the priest, The king has charged me with a matter, and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you, and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread, or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread, if the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, Truly women have been kept from us, as always, when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy, even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread. For there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Then David said to Ahimelech, Then have you not here a spear or a sword in hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it. For there is none but that here. And David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his tens, his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see, the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen? that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence, till this fellow come into my house. And David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him, and he became commander over them. And there were with him about 400 men. And David went from there to Mitzvah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please, let my father and my mother stay with you, till I know what God will do for me. And he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all that time that David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, Do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hareth. The rest withers, the flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon our study tonight. Gracious Father, for the God of all mercies, I come to you this night once more and ask for your blessing upon your word as we have heard it, as we have heard it read and so now we're to hear it preached. Help us, O oh God, to understand this story and these verses in their context. Help us to see, O oh God, the way that they point us to our Savior, Jesus Christ, great David, the greater Son, and help them, O oh Lord, to comfort, to comfort us, for we are your people. We have gathered this night to hear your word. So bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we continue our study this evening of 1 Samuel, working our way through mostly chapter by chapter, although tonight we're taking a little bit more than a chapter. These verses, I believe, go together and kind of are sectioned together to help us see this development or this next development in David's life. And speaking of David's life, he was a man of faith. 
one who trusted in God, trusted in God in every way that we would imagine possible. It, it was, after all, David who was willing to step out onto the battlefield against Goliath when everyone else trembled against even thinking of going out before him. David simply said, who is this uncircumcised fellow that he would speak against the armies of the Lord? How could he possibly speak against God? David was a man of faith. And we tend to believe that the life of faith is a straight line from beginning to end. And most importantly, we tend to think that it is a line that, 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 is, that is always moving in a sense upward. Things are getting better and better. Sure, we might hit bumps along the road, endure a few scrapes and bruises, but our life of faith is generally moving in an upward direction. To be honest, I don't know where such ideas come from. I don't know why let go and let God or, or the prosperity gospel catches so much attention among Christians. Nothing in the experience of God's people recorded for us in the infallible word of God could lead us to that kind of thinking, suffering in this life, and then glory. That doesn't mean, of course, that our lives are as bad as they always could be. God is gracious and kind, and, and we enjoy His presence in many good things in this life. And yet, as Paul tells us, it is through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. We are studying the life of David. We're studying through First and Second Samuel, and, 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 and by default, that's a study of David's life. Really, everything is leading up to David, even before, even with Hannah and Samuel and Saul. It's leading up to David. And here we are, in the midst of David's life. He has been anointed as the king over Israel, God's chosen king. But he has not installed this king. He is rejected at this point because there is a king already on the throne. Saul will not relinquish his kingdom God had said through Samuel that the kingdom had to, what was torn away from Saul. And as far as Saul is concerned, it will need to be literally torn away. He will not give it up. As we saw last week in chapter 20, we saw David and Jonathan's covenant that they had made with one another. There we read about how Saul's intentions were, unco were uncovered by Jonathan. Remember that Jonathan was angry, grieved, and disgraced. He had told David that his father was not going to try to kill him. But David knew the truth. And in time, Jonathan would come to, knew the, could come to know the truth as well. He also became an object of his father's scorn, we saw, as Saul struck out at, at Jonathan in both his words and his actions. The covenant between David and Jonathan, though, would not be broken. It was a covenant of steadfast love, kindness, and peace. This is what we gave our attention to last week as, 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 as we talked and, and, and came to understand it is this covenant that not only uh, undergirds the entirety of Scripture, that is the covenant that God makes with His people, this idea of covenant, but this covenant with David and Jonathan was sustained, David, through many difficulties. And it is co His covenant with the Lord that sustains Him through it all. And so we were, we were encouraged, of course, to look at that, at that great covenant with our Savior, Jesus Christ, for it is in Him that we live and move and have our being. It is in Him that we find comfort in the midst of affliction. Well, speaking of affliction, David's flight begins in our chapter tonight. And what a flight it is. It is true that previously he has, to do he has had to dodge Saul's, spear Saul's spears. He has had to crawl out the window. He has had to run out of town. But now he must leave. He must get as far away as possible. His life will move from place to place as he, as he seeks to avoid Saul. As I consider these verses of this week, the theme is clearly suffering and survival. But it is mixed with some, shall we say, questionable tactics. Deception in words and actions that we'll need to consider. Does David trust the Lord or does he not? Matthew Henry sums it up well. He says, his troubles are very particularly related in this and the following chapters, not only to be a key to the Psalms, but that he might be, as other prophets, an example to the saints in all ages of suffering, affliction, and of patience. And especially that he might be a type of Christ, who being anointed to the kingdom, humbled himself and was therefore highly exalted. The example of the suffering Jesus was a copy without a blot. That of David was not so. Henry hints at what has drawn a lot of attention through the ages. How do we understand David's actions? 
How do we understand David's words? Does David sin in this chapter? And if he does, does that mean that God approves of his actions? These are some questions we will need to consider after we work through our text together. I don't know that I would say that David is completely blameless here. But I also want to make sure that we see the Bible's own reflection on what takes place in these verses. The Psalms that we are singing tonight are written in the context of this chapter. And our responsive reading from the Gospel of Matthew reflects upon this chapter as well. well. Let's look at our chapter together. We see first how it moves from presumption to fear and then to faith. That's the overarching sort of theme that we're looking at tonight. And it begins with this, this kind of presumptuousness as David goes to the priest of Nob. And there he receives sustenance and protection. But it begins, of course, as David comes to, to, to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech comes to David trembling. Trembling, why are you alone, he says, and no one with you. It's hard to know exactly why Ahimelech is trembling. It's hard to know why David went to him. Surely there had to be easier ways of getting loaves of bread. Then again, there were no supermarkets in those days. Perhaps there was a bond between the two. Samuel would, have, would not have been completely disconnected from the worship in the tabernacle. This might explain why Himalek is, trem is trembling. Perhaps he knows the situation. At the very least, he knows that David showing up alone could mean something is wrong. In fact, that's what he wants to know. Why are you alone? After all, David had been appointed the commander of thousands by Saul. News of his departure probably hasn't yet reached Nob. Maybe Ahimelech was concerned that David was acting as a, uh, as a kind of lone wolf assassin on the part of Saul. Whatever the case, there's trembling. And so David seeks to assure him of his good intentions, or at the very least, that he's not there to cause trouble. And this brings us then to that story that David tells. The king has charged me with a matter. Here in these verses, David implies that he's not actually alone, that there are men somewhere. Young men had an appointment. David couldn't divulge what it was, though it was top secret. Mission from the king for his eyes only. A lot of ink is spilled on David's words here. Some say, and some try to avoid sort of the obvious tension by saying that after all, God is king over his people. And so David is there on God's command, and God is the one of whom he's speaking. That seems to be sidestepping the natural reading of the text. The truth is, we have seen this before. Deception in order to protect life. What I found interesting in reflection upon this chapter is whose life is David trying to protect? It would be simple to say, to say he's trying to protect his own life. That is, after all, why he's fleeing from Saul. But I don't think that's what's going on here. I believe he's trying to protect Ahimelech's life. And we're going to find out in the next chapter that this turns out very badly. But David's words here are likely out of a desire to protect, not lie or cheat. He is trying to keep Ahimelech from being drawn in to this, to, this, uh, uh, to this battle that is between him and Saul, knowing that Saul will stand at nothing to bring retribution against David. Well, David then simply turns to ask for help. He says, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. There in the tabernacle, there would be bread that would sit upon uh, the table, uh, uh, the showbread, the bread of the presence, and it was sort of meant. It was there to, to signify a, a man's communion with God. And the bread would be changed out on a regular basis. Uh, and the priests would be permitted to eat that bread in the holy place. You can read of this in the uh, in, in, in those books of uh, Exodus and um, and Leviticus, especially. And so David is looking here for bread. And he's told the only thing that is on hand is this holy bread. But then Ahimelech says, if, if the young men have kept themselves from women. One of the reasons why I look at this text the, the way that I do, uh, especially in the sense that I don't think David is, is, is doing something wrong, at least not, not, not deeply wrong, I should say, is that Jesus interprets this text. He says, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? And we entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Jesus makes clear in interpreting the law that, that, that the law is not some kind of a straitjacket, but rather that it is meant for the good of man. 
And it would have been foolish for him like to sit back and say, oh no, you can't have any because that's the holy bread. Uh, and, and, and only, only the priests may, may partake of that. We do see that he says that, that the young men must have kept themselves from women. And David tells them, tells them and assures him that, that they have kept themselves from, from women. And for more of this, and we won't delve into it too far tonight, but you can go back to Exodus 19. And we read there in chapter 19 and verse 15, uh, as God is preparing to come on Sinai and to meet with the people, he says, be ready for the third day. Or Moses is saying to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. In Leviticus 15, verses 16 to 18, we read again of, uh, of that reality, that, uh, that, that, that relations between men and between a husband and a wife even rendered them unclean until the evening. If you, for those who haven't been with us, I, I've preached through Leviticus, and for those who were there, you've reached far back into your memories. But to remember what I said at that point, that, that, that it's, it's not saying that these relations are bad, but rather that our worship of God is central and ultimate. So there in the, uh, in the camp, in Leviticus, God was to be in the center. Everything else was to be secondary. Signifying, of course, that great truth that throughout uh, the history of God's people, we understand that, that, that the worship of God is our primary action in this life. Well, they said David, for his part, assures uh, Ahimelech that the vessels of the men are holy, and vessels here is, uh, is a euphemism. I'll leave it at that, and you can understand that. He's simply saying that they have, in fact, been kept pure. They can partake of that bread. But that then gives way, as David requests as for food, to his fear. David, of course, would have been on heightened sort of senses. He would have been watching, looking out of the corner of his eyes, worried, of course, that Saul might find out where he was. We read there that a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. Doeg the Edomite, a descendant of Saul, I sorry, of Esau, was present. We are told that he was detained before the Lord. The meaning of that is not altogether clear. He might have been unclean and unable to fulfill a vow or a task that he was sent to do. Whatever the case, his presence causes anxiety in David. Doeg is a servant of Saul. And indeed, David would have known the servant of Saul because David was, in a sense, Saul's right-hand man. And that means the servant of Saul would have known David. And that, of course, is his concern. We don't spend a lot of time on that. It will come up again uh, in chapter 22 next uh, in, in a couple of weeks. But it does lead David to realize that, that he has no weapon on him. So he asks for a spear or a sword. Some have thought it was odd that he would ask for a spear or a sword. But if you go back to chapter 17, you, you remember, of course, that the, 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 the spear of, of, of Goliath and the sword of Goliath were sort of set aside. And it seems that at least one of them has ended up here in the tabernacle. Both have been put in the tabernacle as a gift of dedication. But here is the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. The very sword that David had used to relieve Goliath of his hand. Pause, of course, to consider the providence of God. David did not deposit the sword here so that, it would, so that he would have it in this moment. David did not know that he would be there at Ahimelech without a sword in need of a weapon. But God provides what his servant needed when he needed it. The priest, again, not knowing what is going on, or at least not fully understanding, willingly offers it to David, and David gladly accepts there is none like it. As we see David's presumption as he goes to, uh, to, to Ahimelech, but also this moves in, 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 into fear for David, fear of, uh, um, uh, of Doeg. But that fear actually continues as we move into our second point, as David interacts with the, with the king of Gath. The king of Gath. We read in verse 10, David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. It is not without irony that David takes the sword of Goliath of Gath and runs to Gath to avoid Saul. So dangerous is Saul and so desperate is David that he is willing even to go to the enemies of God's people to find safety, even to the land of Gath. We're not given a lot of information here. We're just told that he went to Achish. He's undoubtedly trying to find a place where Saul would not be able to find him, or at least unable to attack him easily. 
commentators are divided as to exactly what David's reception is. The servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Some believe that this would be uh, um, them sort of patting themselves on the back. Look who has defected from Israel. Look who has come to us. The others think that there's something, uh, um, um, something in their words that sets David off. We're, we're not exactly sure. Is it the case that his arrival in the city arouses suspicion? Or are they a bit too happy to see David there? Whatever the case, they call David the king of the land. He's not the king officially. But they seem to be picking up on, and maybe this is why David has his response, that he does, that there's some kind of struggle between Saul and David. Saul has struck down his thousands. David has struck down his ten thousands. David then realizes that his life might be at, at much, at, as much at risk in the royal court of Gath as it was in the royal court of Gideon. And so we read there in verse 12 that David took these words to heart. He pondered them. He paid attention to them. He noted the way that they were said and, 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 and what it could mean. And says that he was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. It's remarkable to reflect upon David's response. Again, we have this tendency to think that the life of faith is one where, you, where you're practically bulletproof. You're, you're not affected by those things that happen around you in the world. But here we see David running for food, hiding, being afraid. He experiences every single emotion, every single uh, 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 um, sense that we, would, that we would expect somebody to go through like this. And yet David knows that it is the Lord who orders the steps. David understands that it is God who is over his life. It is God who he trusts. And so David's fight or flight response kicks in and he, just, he intends to fly. And he does this by getting Achish to dismiss him. He pretends to be insane. We read here that he scratches at the gate, at the, at the doors of the gate. He lets the spit run down his beard. He pretended that he had no care of his appearance. He acted in a way that was not becoming a king or a warrior. The psalms that we're singing tonight, to go along with this, and I want to recap them now, at least the first two that we've sung, Psalm 34 and Psalm 56. You can read in the introduction of the psalms uh, themselves that, that, that what they, they took place when, uh, when David was before Abimelech. That is when he changed his behavior before Abimelech. When the Philistines seized him. And each one, he acknowledges the, the, the struggles that he had. He acknowledges the dangers that were before him. Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 56, Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me all day long and attack or oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I am afraid, I put my trust in You, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? David, the mighty warrior king, was afraid. But what does he do in his fear? He turns to the Lord. We don't want to see that David is here before us in Psalm 21, scheming as though he trusts in himself or in his own abilities or in his own ability to trick someone. He plays the madman, but it is God who will secure his safety. And indeed, his safety is secure. And it happens because Achish looks at David recognizes the, the spit running down his beard, the scratching of the door, and recognizes that this man is mad. Do I laugh, madmen, that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Perhaps his servants had thought that they were bringing Achish a gift. Here is the great David. He is yours for the taking. But instead, Achish rebukes them, and David's plan is successful. He is not the only one to fool the Philistine king when his life is in danger, of course, as we remember Abraham 
and Isaac doing the same as well in their own ways. But this moment further sharpens the contrast between David and Saul. David took upon himself the trappings of insanity to hide his sanity. Saul surrounded himself with the trappings of sanity to cloak his insanity. David debased himself, and God heard his cry. The Psalms reflect on this moment and show that David is not trying to cleverly devise his own way of escape, but rather he's trusting in God. He seeks the Lord. He knows that it is God who makes his way safe. Indeed, beloved, in all of our doings, we must have the same approach. The Apostle James will apply this kind of thinking to the everyday life of believers in James chapter 4, verses 13 to 15, when he says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. You see, David is a reflection of, of, of what this looks like. It's not a life of inactivity. It's not a life that freezes us. We can't make a decision until we know exactly what it is that God has willed. It's that we live and move and have our being, trusting that God is the one who is guiding and caring for us. That it is in God that we trust, as we read of David saying in the Psalms, even as he moved from, from, from Ahimelech to Achish. David is growing. He is growing. He is becoming, uh, he's been becoming wiser, we could say. And that wisdom comes out here as we see him with the king of Moab. His three encounters. Yes, they show us that David is on the run. It shows us that David is, is concerned for his life and the life of others. It also shows us his growth. He's gone from a hasty moment in Nob to a, 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 a moment where, where he realizes that he needs to get out in Gath. And now he begins to, to gather to himself uh, followers as God brings them to him. Let's look at now the opening verses of chapter 22. David departed from there and escaped the cave of Adulam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men, captain, or some translators, and I think in my original reading, and commanders, commander over them. David leaves Gath, and he, he goes to Adonam, which is in the territory of Judah. So he's gone out of the land, and now he's returned back into the land. And his family comes out to see him. His family comes out, perhaps, because they were concerned that Saul would target them. Remember, we talked last week in the covenant with David and Jonathan, that tendency in the ancient Near Eastern world that when there was a new king that was appointed, they, they, they would attack anyone who had a right to the throne or who could pretend to have a right to the throne. This is why Jonathan asks for David's favor, not just for himself, but for his descendants. Because his descendants are Saul's descendants. David, of course, assures Jonathan that he will show steadfast love and kindness and mercy to him. And for the same reason, it's likely that his family has come out and come to the place where David is to find protection, to find help. But they weren't alone. It's hard to know exactly the motives of those who came out. They're described as in distress, in debt, bitter in soul. There's a kind of discontentment in them with Saul that brings them to David. A discontentment that drove the people to David. After all, he was the true Messiah. He was the king, the anointed one. He was the one that God had appointed the man after God's own heart. It's not, maybe it's not hard to even understand why, why it is that the people would turn away from one who was wicked. That is Saul. And turn toward one who trusted in God to turn toward David. It's this discontentment, of course, that drives people to David, even as it is discontentment with our sin, with this world, that drives us to Christ, great David's greater son. As one of the hymn writers writes, Come ye sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore, Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, joined with power. He is able, he is willing, doubt no more. You see, of course, that David uh, 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 points us to Christ because he indeed is one who cares. 
He goes to the king of Moab. And he says, please let my father and my mother stay with you till I know what God will do for me. That's striking, isn't it? David trusts in God even though he doesn't know exactly what this is going to look like. He knows that his life belongs to the Lord, but how that's going to play out, he doesn't know. But he trusts God. And so he leaves his parents with the king of Moab. David trusts in the Lord's purposes. He no longer presumes upon him. You might wonder why it is the king of Moab has granted David's request. I can think of at least two reasons. One is probably a more academic sort of idea. The other, I think, is, has more grounding. But the academic idea usually comes along with the, come with the notion that there was an ancient Near Eastern practice of providing sanctuary for adversaries of enemies. And since the Moabites were against the Israelites, it would make sense that the king of Moab would be willing to house the parents of Israel's future king. It might create some goodwill and provide opportunity for, uh, uh, for a relationship in the future. But remember that this is David. His great-grandmother is a Moabitess. David comes from the Moabites, though he was in, uh, born in Judah. In his lineage is a Moabitess. And so it's more likely that that relationship shows here as David's parents are provided for, protected, and cared for. And that then brings us to our final verse. We've seen David move. We've seen David hasty with the priest of Nob. We've seen David fearful and, and acting insane with the king of Gath. And now we see David walking in wisdom, but not just walking in wisdom, but absolutely, completely trusting in God. The prophet Gad said to David, Do not remain in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest. Horeb. He did not remain in the safe place, that is, the stronghold. He trusted in the word of God, that is, the word of the prophet, even though it put him, again, in harm's way. Saul is actively working against the word of God, but David heeds the words of the prophet. And it is here, in the cave of Adullam, where we read David, where David writes of in Psalm 57. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame him who tramples on me. Once more we see that David is trusting in the Lord. His faith in God's purpose and his faith in God's promise is instructive to us. And yet there is more. For each of these psalms, in each of these psalms, he writes about his experience, but he pushes further, and they become a pattern of suffering and then glory, sorrow before joy. That pattern, of course, is the pattern of Scripture. That pattern, of course, is the pattern that is that, that, that we see in the life of Jesus Christ, as, as Matthew Henry pointed out in his commentary at the very beginning of our sermon. Christ first suffers and then enters into glory. These psalms point us forward to Christ. And not just in general ways, but in specific ways. For think of Psalm 34 and verse 20. He keeps all his bones, not one of them shall be broken. This psalm is quoted in John chapter 19, verses 33 to 36, when Jesus is on the cross. And they step out, the, the, the soldiers come out to break the knees, to break the bones. They see that Jesus is dead. They place the spear. They thrust the spear into his side, and blood and water flow. We read uh, in, in John 19, 36, for these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. You see, David is not just one who sort of in a, in a, in a general vague way points us to Christ. But his life, all that he would go through, points us forward to the one who would suffer in our behalf. And so, beloved, of course, we can entrust ourselves like David did to the one who is all glorious and the one who knows all. The one whose purposes will stand from the beginning of creation all the way to the end. After all, this is why the Apostle Paul could cry out that I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. David's life then reminds us of the pattern 
the pattern that points us to the, to, to, to the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ, but pushes further even into our own lives. And we, like David, move in that direction of learning to trust God, of putting our faith in Him, singing psalms to Him, knowing that He is the one who cares for us. That in all of our trials and tribulations, nothing happens that is outside of the control of our God, and that He is bringing us to Himself. 